good evening and a very warm welcome to you all esteemed guests members students and friends i hope you are staying safe and keeping well on behalf of the chennai center for china studies and the national maritime foundation i welcome you all to this c3s nmf book discussion on the security of india's ports coast and maritime trade challenges in the 21st century when we talk of modern india as the emerging economy development has become a primary agenda in realizing india's economic goals given that 90% of india's trade by volume takes place through water transport the significance of ports and the shipping se sector in india cannot be overstated the non conventional security threats within the indian ocean region surrounding india's ports and coasts have become a pressing issue as india's rise as a global power is to be backed by a strong and secure blue economy moreover china's insatiable appetite in acquiring strategic ports in close proximity of indian territory demands a renewed focus on the security of india's coasts and maritime trade this book discussion is aimed at highlighting key insights on this issue from dr mohit nayar's book on this pertinent subject I would like to take this opportunity to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Mohit Nile. Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Mohit Nile is a research scholar and a prolific research writer. He also served under the Ministry of Defence, Indian Army. He has an extensive background in military education, and in 2012, he was awarded a PhD in political science from the H N B Garhwal University. He was also offered the position of Chair of Excellence in 2012 from the United Services Institute, Delhi, for the project on the future of Myanmar, role for India, China, and the international community. Dr. Nayal also worked with the National Maritime Foundation as a research fellow from 2018 to to 2020. His areas of interest include artificial intelligence, geodynamics of China. strategic challenges in south asia and southeast asia maritime interests in the indo pacific region among other issues he has authored four other books including the invisible wall of china and beyond the city lights which covers the socio economic problems of people from urban india it is truly an honor to have you speak to us this day sir before i hand over the session to our moderator for the day commodore vijesh garg I would like to invite Commodore R S Vasan, Indian Navy retired, Director C three S and Regional Director of the National Maritime Foundation, to deliver his opening remarks. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Nisha. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I also would like to acknowledge the presence of Director General N M F, and many officers from uh, National Maritime Foundation, Delhi, Admiral Murli Dharan, Commodore Dai Rao, uh, Captain Kiran Kankoje. Uh, and uh, various others and of course special guest dr bamdev from nepal uh, who has made it a point to attend all our programs and has also recently contributed an article uh, as far as uh, mohit's book discussion today is uh, you know the intention was more to look at not just the book but the present day challenges that there are in terms of managing our coastal security our port security uh, you know security of ships and assets you know which has become increasingly uh, important to us I have known uh, Mohit for uh, over three years now, three and a half years. You know, from the time when he joined NMF, I used to run into him in Delhi, and we've been in touch ever since. And uh, you know, he's done a good job of uh, bringing out this uh, very uh, important book uh, that identifies the challenges, looks at the existing scenario, and also uh, gives us the way ahead uh, options for uh, enhancing the security. Uh, just to put the context in the right perspective. uh you know you all know that uh, the very first time that we realized that uh, we have porous borders was way, way back in 93 when a lot of rdx was smuggled through the maharashtra coast from ratnagiri and you know it created mayhem in uh, bombay and uh, thereafter of course uh, we we uh, again had many more incidents like this of course uh, the bombay uh, attack uh, you know the, the, by the terrorists who came from uh, the sea routes but what changed the entire uh, situation as far as coastal security is concerned is actually uh, cargill surprisingly uh, a land scenario in 1999 uh, 
thereafter this group of ministers was formed and they went through the exercise of giving the recommendations on how we can revamp our coastal security our border security how the the states have to be empowered uh, to bring in their own maritime uh, police wing which is called the coastal security group etc so you know all of us in the last uh, couple of days have been looking at these photographs of this container vessel express mile uh, you know which which actually Kola, uh, has uh, sunk off uh, colombo in waters of 21 meters that and that is scary because it's southwest monsoon we don't know where all these entire uh, pollutants including nitric acid and the mixtures which are there uh, will be brought to the shores so it is not in the realm of conventional security but in the overall concept of a holistic security which looks at, looks at maritime security issues but also you know as far as the this program is concerned we also found it very important that you know both the chennai center for china studies and the national maritime foundation you know, use this opportunity to examine the present day challenges, not just along the 7,516 kilometers coast or our offshore islands, where again, there's been a lot of writing on the LNM issues recently, where we found, uh, you know, heroin, uh, arms, ammunition, etc., which was there. So it tells us that uh, there are uh, still gray areas which are not addressed. But the new entrant, which directly affects our coastal security and offshore security is China. China, the new player, and which is why the Chennai, Chennai Center for China Studies and the National Maritime Foundation have come together to look at the issues in the light of new developments, not related to the Colombo financial city alone, which is right in our neighborhood, but also in terms of what we've been facing in the last, uh, uh, you know, last month specifically. We also saw what happened when, uh, you know, the uh, during the the cyclone. Uh, we had so many lives which are lost uh, in Bombay High, uh, Mumbai High. And so therefore, uh, I'm sure that this forum will address all these issues after uh, uh, Colonel Mohit Nayal presents his uh, areas. And uh, I would now request Commodore Vijayeshkar to take over and moderate the session. And as is usual, please keep yourself muted so that uh, you, know, uh, you can serve the bandwidth, number one, but also there is no distraction. And the other uh, request is that please pose all your questions only in the chat box. Because the moment uh, somebody has the mic, it becomes difficult to control the flow of uh, question answer sessions. So it's better to put them all in the chat box so that the, uh, the, the web discipline is maintained. Thank you and over to Vijesh, all, all yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nisha and um, Kodo Vasan for introducing the subject and getting the focus on the book, which uh, Dr. Mohit Tanayal has written. Now, the topic is very relevant to all of us in India and the global community who's dealing with a maritime subject. Now, what is maritime subject we're talking about? The 90% of the trade of the world, the tune of almost $5 trillion is going to the ships. If they're the ships, they have to be coast, they have to be coast, they have to be port. Now, the threat to this area is going in various directions especially in the non-conventional direction. Boston mentioned about 1993, when we start looking focused toward that side first time. But you look in 2000, 2000, when USS Cole was actually attacked in Eden Port. Again, we came down, the Minister Committee recommended of a very joint uh, synergy between um, Navy, Coast Guard, Marine Police and all that. We came on that. But then the piracy came in 2008 onwards, the whole African coast was infested. The Navy has been doing it. Coast Guard has been doing on the subject since then. It became further than people, all uh, merchant ships having started with armed guards on board. And then we had 2012 off Cochin incident. We all remember the two merchant um, fishermen were killed in a spontaneous fire. It's still on. The court is still on. So issue is, and now we are looking at beyond it. Now we are looking at industry 4.0. That is the IT revolution. Now the cyber attacks have taken much more prominence than the, actually the live attacks by the guns by the pirates. So the dimension is increasing day by day. The complications are coming. They are not attacking only the ships. Now they are attacking the port sports system. And today we are looking at like your uh, the whole 
system of port to logistics to ships, which is totally automated now. Ships are automated systems. So if a cyber attack man try to attack, he can disable a ship in the moment. Is cargo handling things. So we are looking that way. So this this way, the maritime economy, the maritime infrastructure, in overall sense is a threat. And we, as a think tank, we as a professional, we got to think what are ways to we can handle it. I think Mohit has done a good job, which came out of his book. It's a very latest book, the January 2021 got published. And rest, I'll hand over to Mohit to start. Thank you, Mohit. All for you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Mohit, you are audible. You can go ahead. Yeah, I'm just trying to link it with the presentation. Just give me a minute. Uh, is the presentation on a sharing okay. basis? Yes, it's coming up. Yes. You just have to make it full screen. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bala, can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. We are able to see it. And I am audible? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Uh, well, to start with, a uh, very good evening to all and uh, uh, extended welcome. My sincere thanks to C3S and National Maritime Foundation for giving me this opportunity today evening to talk about my book, that is Security of India's Port, Coast and Maritime Trade, Challenges in the 21st Century. Well, many of people who are today present are from NMF and are aware about my background. But to those who I have not interacted in person, in September 2018, I landed up with a study leave into National Maritime Foundation with a smirk in the empty branch stating that uh, you know you wanted study leave, which is believed to be a time of enjoyment for the military persons because it is considered to be a rest and recoup zone for two years. So they said, now you're going to do a setup where you're going to be with the naval officers. You are going to be working from morning to evening, which is not uh, norms which are done in the you know study leave. So it was more of a sorting out. And when I could uh, you know see that, I said, uh, I mean, I I don't look at it this way. And if uh, Admiral Chauhan remembers our first discussion, the very first time I met, I said, sir, I'm here to learn, and I've come uh, with a lot of hunger. And uh, you know, I will never be able to match up the pace in which uh, a naval officer would have you know comprehended a lot of issues over the service years. But I will put my best foot forward and try to pick up as much as possible. And uh, believe you me, uh, every moment, every day which I spent in NMF was a learning. And uh, uh, I mean, uh, with scratch zero knowledge of maritime security aspects, I started. And uh, within two years of my completion of my period with NMF, I was able to produce a book. So uh, clearly taking the credit of my work would be uh, a fool's paradise. Uh, it was definitely every individual, right from DG to ED to DD, to all officers and research scholars who were there, they all were part of my journey. And uh, rightly, we are still connected. And I hope for this association to continue for a very long time. Uh, having said so, uh, the focus today will be security. That is why I highlighted. So everything resolves uh, around uh, sorry security. To, sorry to intervene. Can you please go to yes, the Please go to the uh, Thank you. I am on now. And now is it visible, sir? Perfect, perfect. Okay. I'm so sorry. Probably the technology has taken a little bit of turn. Uh, so I'll come down to the content. Uh, this entire book forms eight chapters, and there are around 1,000, uh, 1,20,000 words that I had written in this entire thing, less the referencing. And there were around 1,100 referencing which were entirely used in this book. Uh, the first chapter starts with the history of maritime economy. How in the ancient time, various civilizations understood that if they need to prosper, 
and become bigger, they need to use the maritime routes and develop their economy. The moment economic aspects came into being, the security aspects also worked in tandem. <laughs> the book then talks about Indian Ocean region, various littoral states, and how India got impacted with various marine part dominated things coming to our coastal regions. With that, the post independence era brought stagnation. There was nothing much which happened as far as the port and the coastal development was concerned. We primarily relied on what the Britishers had left us. Much of it is because the liberalization phase for India started in the 1990s. Much, much being a visionary in 2003, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee, came up with the concept of Sagar Mala. And the logic was to develop the ports and coastal region and ensure that much of our dependence on export and import, which is today at 96%, is fully utilized for the benefit of the economy. However, the next decade, because of the political inertia, nothing much happened as far as Sagar Mala was concerned. In 2014, the present Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, decided to give a lot of emphasis on Sagar Mala. The book talks in detail about Sagar Mala. Further, the issues related to Indian Ocean region, where India had the logic that you know, when it develops, it is going to have opportunities coming its way for the littoral nations also. So the issue of Mossam and Sagar were also part of this chapter. And finally, how does India visualize a blue economy as it becomes a developing power? Coming down to Sagar Mala, primarily the four standing pillars for Sagar Mala are connectivity, portlet industrial development, port modernization, and coastal community development. As far as port modernization is concerned, in the last couple of years, not only has the government made a reasonable amount of investments, but also policy checks have been brought in place where optimum utilization of the existing port structure has been achieved. India is also looking for transshipment facilities, which we relied on Singapore and Colombo port for a very long time. As far as port connectivity is concerned, as late as last month, the freight corridor, the western one, is almost 50% in a functional state. And by 2022, the Western Corridor will be fully functional, connecting Bombay with Delhi. And that's a reasonable achievement. In parallel, a lot of work has gone to develop national highways. And there is enough resources and time spent for development of inland waterways. As far as port-led development is concerned, there is a public-private partnership which has been encouraged because of which government has come with various schemes, whether it is development of coastal economic zones or whether it is providing tax benefit and various other things. There is a lot going on to ensure that industrialization comes in these areas. As far as the community is concerned, there was a very interesting report of 2018 by FICI which said that no matter how much development may come to these coastal areas, the locals may not find employment because of lack of skill. Therefore, under Sagar Mala, the government has emphasized upon skill development of the population there. And it was interesting during my research to find that many of the private and ports, uh, other activities which are happening in these areas Majority of people have been taken on employment are locals. Further, there is a huge dependence on fishery. Therefore, not only the sea-related fishery has been given emphasis, but the land systems for fishery development are also being explored. There are enough financial resources which have been made available to people so that the economic prosperity comes with the national economic prosperity. 
This is just to give you a highlight of how the concept of economic development has been brought up. This is the only chapter which probably does not talk of security, but just puts the economic perspective and the vision that we have as a developing nation in the, in the forefront. Now coming to any level of security mechanisms that need to come in place. The first thing is one has to understand the international and national organizations dealing with the frameworks which are there for sea control, the coastal area control. In this regard, there are plethora of organizations and India is party to many of them. I, during the research, was more interested interested to focus on those areas which concerned India. What is India's position in international maritime organization? What are our issues related to ballast water? What are we talking in terms of continental shelf? Whether there are issues related to the Italian Marines, which has gone to international tribunal? Uh, how is the case being presented? And so many other issues which, which we are uh, you know handling through these organizations. So that was my area of focus when I was looking at the international organizations. And finally, there were a number of regulatory setups within India. It was firstly the CRPC, the IPC, the Indian Coast Guard Acts, and many more, which uh, gave a reasonable idea of how we are controlling the movement of ships in these areas, how we are trying to monitor resources in this area. And uh, uh, one can actually speak uh, quite a bit on this topic regarding role and you know the fault lines in these organizations. And uh, probably during my exposure in MMF, I also tried to do my LLB, which I will be getting by July as my degree. So my interest actually got uh, very much generated into legal aspects of uh, you know maritime domain. And I'm further going to work on it. And uh, these are very interesting areas. Coming down to the next important aspect uh, was the technology. No matter how many, uh, I mean, how much amount of boots on ground one puts, but unless you utilize the technology in the best capacity, uh, it is very difficult to put a eye on ground for such a big area. But there is a word of caution also. The word of caution is that sometimes certain technologies which are in use in Western nations or in other places around the world may not have uh, direct uh, you know, relevance for us. Like, for instance, uh, some community in the coastal region may just have a color of a particular boat in a uh, uniform manner, which is good enough for identifying the boats which are of that local area. Uh, as a first stage of identification, whether we continue using it or we develop more technically sophisticated mechanism, it is a choice. But as far as technology is concerned, today, whether it is individual ship uh, uh, beacons to give its position, or whether it is more sophisticated technology for maritime domain awareness, whether on uh, land, whether uh, in sea or in air, there are enough mechanisms. There are transponders, satellites, and so many other devices. So I try to cover much of it and try to find how much is it relevant and how are we actually going about covering areas where are the logical gaps. To do so, uh, in a nutshell, this is the structure in which I try to deal with the issue. Firstly, the command structure, like IMAC. Today, much of the white shipping moving in the Indian Ocean region is being looked after by IMAC. And then there is NC3IN, which is then set up for the Navy to look into command and control structures. So I spoke and I mean I wrote about all these issues which are there. And finally, various systems in place, organizations in place, and then the technology. And what was the aim of presenting the various organizations and technology? Primarily to put an important factor in the forefront. That is, if the economy has to develop, the aspects of security cannot create inertia for them. They need to be facilitating the economic activity rather than slowing them down. So much of these technologies which we already have or we intend to 
you know, employ in our coastal and port security should be facilitators in terms of making our systems more efficient rather than creating a drag. The next issue was regarding environmental issues. And uh, I have not met uh, Dr. Bajaj, who probably joined NMF by the time I was uh, wrapping up from there, but he has not worked on environmental issues. And I would not, uh, you know, even assume that I have uh, in-depth knowledge of environmental issues. But then when I was working on security aspects, just to evade the environmental security did not seem to be in order. So I tried covering the major concerns that we have as far as the environmental security is there. Some of them uh, I would just flash for you. Firstly, the ship breaking. Uh, as the, many of us are aware, the ship breaking activities used to happen in more Western nations. But over the years, the moment the uh, damages that it could cause to the environment, individuals was understood, uh, they started moving these activities uh, to the developing nations. Today, when we see the world figures, we realize much of the ship breaking is taking place in Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. China was also there, but they are slowly getting it done. So the bottom line is uh, somewhere we need a detailed study. We, if we require more focus. We need to understand this entire issue. Uh, like what are we getting at? Uh, but sometimes uh, these, these are very important issues in terms of when I was looking at the Chinese first uh, model of establishing the industry, uh, their economic zone, which was just opposite Hong Kong, had the first industry which was scrap industry because they realized if they had to outbeat the market which were developed, they had to offer something which those markets could not offer. So Hong Kong would have some scrap industry set up in the coastal region. So China offered it. But soon they made amendments and those things are out. So we need to have a balance. Should we completely go away with it or it is time to start thinking how to slow down this process? or refine it in a manner that the environmental issues are not affected. The next issue is regarding the use of plastic. Over the years, uh, the world is facing the problem of plastic production. It is increasing by volumes and the final disposition is in the sea. So the marine life is affected, the life in the coastal areas is affected, even the uh, you know, the food supply chain for humans is going to get affected if this problem is not addressed. So that's one of the major concerns of environmental security. Uh, some other issues which uh, got covered in, uh, covered in this book were regarding the pollution by the ships, the food security, artificial reefs and soil erosion. And soil erosion is quite an alarming issue. Uh, many of the littoral states over the years are going to lose a reasonable amount of land mass if uh, we do not take proactive steps in this regard. And once that happens, obviously humans will get affected and will lead to security, especially the non-conventional security concerns will figure out. So uh, coming now to the heart of the uh, book discussion, that is the non-conventional aspect. Ironically, nations react to non-conventional security requirements after occurrence of some episode, a trigger is required. And probably for us, the 26-11 Mumbai terror attack was that trigger. So the question arises, was the coastal area always safe? Were there no threats from the coastal region as far as India was concerned? Probably no. In 1993, Mumbai had the serial blast. And before that also, in our coastal region, we had problems of you know, illegal movements into our coastal region from Sri Lanka and various other you know, issues. But then what is important is this particular incident of 2008 shook off the top brasses and uh, things were put in place at the highest level. And it was decided that the port and coastal security requires multiple agencies to come together not only those which are directly involved into the security, but also those which are functioning in the coastal region and have direct indirect emphasis on impact on the security. So all this was put uh, together and the Indian Navy rose to the occasion and it was given overall responsibility to ensure that our coastal regions are safe. 
much of my understanding at national maritime foundation while interacting with the officers and reading the various documents and books and material available i realized that the navy has uh, not only risen to the occasion it has gone beyond the given mandate it has not only assisted in ensuring coastal security but it has also made reasonable impact in the indian ocean region like for instance the indian ocean naval symposium was an initiative started by the indian navy today there are 35 navies which are jointly exercising coordinating amongst themselves uh, one could have not expected uh, such a uh, well oiled system to come up at such a short duration as far as uh, indian ocean rim association is concerned it has got 20 members they wanted to have a joint maritime policy but because of various interventions it has still not seen the light of the day I might have already covered uh, the edition is in 2018. Uh, it has now got an information fusion center, and uh, it's a treat to be there. And through NMF, uh, I was lucky to uh, first hand get the information how they were functioning, how uh, how the monitoring of the white shipping is being done, with all details, the size of the ship and the quantum of material it is moving, the place it is moving. So much of the data is available. Uh, coming back to the Indian Navy, it understood the importance of maritime security, and that is why it took out doctrine in 2005, and subsequently revised those doctrines in 2007, 2009, and 15, and the vigor continues. When you read into many of these, which I did, one realizes that uh, all aspects which one could think of, whether it is surveillance, whether it is uh, ability to uh, you know reach in those areas, ability to put uh, deterrence, maybe has worked in detail in many of these aspects. To pick one of them, uh, it is the HADR. Today, uh, the Indian Navy has uh, put a high benchmark in terms of its ability. to react to the hadr uh, situations in the littoral states in the indian ocean region and beyond and it is well appreciated and it has brought uh, a great name for the nation now having spoken about the indian navy uh, and covered it in various uh, initiatives my attention is towards the indian coast guard in 1971 after the indo pak war there was a realization that probably it was time to let the navy focus towards its conventional task and leave the uh, non conventional threats to another agency with that logic in mind the rustam ji committee was formed and under that uh, admiral kamath in 1978 became the first head of the indian coast guard today it's a well oiled uh, organization covering the entire coastal region of the country it has got various command structures with the regional headquarters and sub regional centers uh, they are primarily undertaking duties of uh, policing they have enough mechanisms of surveillance and ensuring that all threats from the sea are put under check to exercise this particular duty the navy has been given a legal mandate so there are maritime zone acts the foreign vessel act the um, uh, you know the unlawful act drug usage and many other things which empower the navy uh, the action the coast guard and the coast guard has not only restricted itself to this primary duty it has also made enough influence within the region like for instance in the last couple of years navy uh, the indian coast guard has coordinated joint exercises with countries uh, the uh, indian uh, correction the coast guard of bangladesh myanmar sri lanka and many more nations so it's a developing uh, you know uh, science and i am very positive in the coming years the indian coast guard will have a much bigger role to play Uh, today we see the area which uh, is covered under the indian uh, search and rescue region it's 4.6 million square kilometers and the uh, agency which is looking after it is the uh, indian coast guard and they are doing a reasonably good job well uh, there are the good talks about what the coast guard is doing my primary aim was to look into also those fault lines which are in existence so the first issue which was little debated in the nmf also was oversea deployment uh, is there a possibility in future that we would like some part of uh, some elements of our security mechanism to be deployed overseas 
can it be coast guard and whether coast guard can be utilized as of now the mandate given to it as per its raising charter it cannot deploy obviously in overseas uh, ports but uh, probably uh, there is uh, you know reasons to start thinking in those lines the united states has already done so although much of their activities have come under criticism there have been uh, you know issues when the people have been deployed abroad but uh, should we not read about it examine this issue or should we just dump it on the face value so these are issues which i feel we need to see especially as india develops into a greater economy where we are looking for faster movement of goods from india to foreign nations and from foreign nations into our territory next issue is inland waterways much has been spoken about uh, the connectivity of the hinterland with uh, inland waterways my first concern was that any person who is involved into economic activity would like the items or the goods that he is sending to have reasonable amount of security and apart from security they need to follow timelines for delivery now which organization would facilitate such movement possibly the aspect of indian coast guard advising involving evolving in this aspect is something which i thought needs for more consideration as far as scientific research is concerned i was very happy to get these feedbacks that indian coast guard cadres are getting exposed to the scientific research in the indian ocean area and i feel uh, this spare heading of this particular thing should be there with the indian coast guard and their involvement and uh, indulgence in this aspect should further increase and the last point which i felt was that it is now time that you know that superimposition of the navy which is actually difficult the reason is because waters can't be uh, you know the compartment lines so when you have a naval fleet movement obviously it cannot have demarcation of who's responsible for what but having said so this still requires some mechanism to ensure that the near coastal issues are not having dual responsibility between the navy and the indian coast guard and much can be done to synchronize these aspects and make them better uh, the next agency which i would like to talk about is the customs department well to further give more teeth to the custom department in 2017 it was decided to merge the customs maritime organization with the department of revenue and uh, the indian coast guard to have more synergy between all uh, departments and have more effectiveness now as far as the uh, broad duties of the custom department is it is to look into all types and variety of ships which are uh, ferries they are boats whether they are vessels and ensure uh, that they uh, they get into the import duties uh, regulations for which uh, uh, the custom act 1962 is in place and there are various manuals which have come for the delivery of uh, you know the duties there however having said what is in existence again the fault lines within the departments exist firstly there is a shortage of manpower which uh, ideal uh, ideally should be more second is uh, the posting in these uh, coastal areas of the custom department is more considered as a punishment posting and the continuity of senior officials is lacking much uh, due to these issues uh, you realize that uh, the department is there but it is not optimally functioning for instance uh, much of the weapons which are available with the custom department the boats for patrolling which are available with them are reasonably obsolete and not in order so it's time that probably these issues need to be addressed uh, that's uh, have been understood by the government of india and that is why the department manual manual was last revised in 2019 and many of these challenges have been put to order and hopefully in the coming years probably the custom department will have a better optimal functionality as far as uh, yeah the uh, next organization uh, is concerned this is the border security force 
uh, for uh, a person who is uh, not privy to the functioning of the border security force, it is assumed that much of their duties are bounded in the uh, land areas uh, of uh, our neighboring borders. But then the border security force has a water wing and they are manning nearly 1400 kilometers. That's quite an area. But then the question comes to mind that uh, both the roles are not intermingable. So whoever is a domain expert in the water wing cannot be utilized for land duties. So the question comes, should this force be divided in these charters or do you require a separate force to look into water wing part of the uh, water security force? So I've done an analysis of the present uh, challenges that the water security forces are facing and whether it is uh, Correct on the part as national policy makers that we give them this duty on an extended period. So these are some issues which are brought in the book. Now coming to maritime police, all coastal states today have developed uh, the maritime police and a reasonable amount of funding has been done to bring them to a particular standard. But then uh, what I looked for is there was uh, certain problems which were quite common in most of these uh, state police uh, which are involved into maritime uh, issues. Firstly, uh, they have still not done land acquisition, which has not allowed police stations to come near those jetties and near the you know, port areas where they can be effective. The manpower which is being given to marine police uh, are not trained for the task they are expected to expedite. And they are hugely dependent on the Indian Coast Guard and Navy for their training. So this kind of uh, force uh, is probably something which requires a reasonable amount of rear to be made effective. And I have given a reasonable amount of uh, thought to it in the book and certain suggestions how this particular thing can be worked up and improved. As far as the CISF is concerned, uh, it is primarily uh, being deployed on all strategic installation in the uh, coastal region. So whether it is industrial unit, space installation, major ports, heavy engineering, uh, you know, plants, the CISF is providing security to these areas. They are also further looking into consultancy to private enterprises and other semi-government organizations to ensure that they also come to a requisite standard of security. They have expertise in fire uh, handling and uh, they, they can well look into the aspects of sabotage, hostage situation and terror attack. What, what was uh, in the entire study missing was that probably the amount of use that the technology could have been brought in, that has not happened with CISF. They are reasonably restricted. Probably in the coming years, uh, they need to be equipped with better technologies so that uh, their impact and influence increases further. Now, the next organization is the Land Port Authority of India. So what I understood was the conceptualization of this organization in 2010 was done with the aim that all those uh, neighbors of India which are landlocked like Bhutan and Nepal, if they want to use the port, the items which are sent to the port are put through security checks and various other checks before they land up in those areas. So keeping that in mind, 13 integrated check posts all over India were established. Many of the ministries are integrated with this entire thing and various facilities in terms of accommodation, warehouses, banking facilities are being provided. So uh, it's a good establishment. But when we look into the fault line, uh, it is very alarming to see that the products moving from Nepal to a port 700 kilometers in India takes a clearance time of two months and that is quite a bit of time. And probably because of this uh, lack of efficiency in handling the movement of goods, today a country like Nepal is looking for access to the Chinese port, which are 3,000 kilometers away from their land areas. And this is an area of concern, which uh, we need to address. We need to find mechanisms to make uh, this particular setup more efficient. Uh, the Ministry of Shipping, Road, Transport and Highway. In 2004, it was merged, but as of today, both are working in a separate setup. They have uh, 
four subordinate directorates, which are very important, and a number of PSUs like the shipyard infrastructure, inland waterways, and many other setups which are working under the Ministry of Shipping, uh, which are there. So to pick up few of them, uh, let's see Director General of Shipping. As far as uh, policy making is concerned for shipping, uh, the Director General of Shipping is involved heavily. They look into uh, pollution preventive mechanisms. They look into training. They are responsible for the administrative duties. They are responsible for training of the sailors, certifying the uh, bearing uh, merchandise officers. And all these activities are done with uh, the regulations in place, going back to the Merchant Shipping Act of 1958. Uh, so uh, this uh, department is fully functional in various areas around the littoral zones. Now coming to the Directorate uh, General of Lighthouse and Lightship, with its headquarters in Nevada, it's got uh, nine regional centers. Uh, very lately, I think two weeks back, it was in news when the Prime Minister appreciated the work uh, these uh, Directorate General of Lighthouse has done. So any ship which is 20 meters and beyond uh, is put under surveillance with 24 passive devices like the recon radar the transponders. Every movement of uh, ships which is happening closer to the coastal region is put under surveillance. They, they, they have got uh, uh, enough uh, differential global positioning uh, systems to uh, execute their task. Now, uh, coming to the Ministry of Fishing, Animal, Husbandry and uh, Dairy. That's a very important one, primarily because uh, most of the people rely on uh, fishing as their livelihood. And because of that, the locals uh, are more uh, comfortable to interact with the officials of the fishing department. So whenever there is any untoward incident or anything which the security agencies need to know, probably it is the fishing department officials who come to know it first. So therefore, it is very important that they also are uh, put into the loop of the coastal security. As far as the facilities are concerned, they look after fishing harbors, they look after fishing processing centers and uh, uh, deep vessels which are moving in that area. However, as far as the export of ships, uh, fishes are concerned, which is quite a volumetrically high load, the Ministry of Commerce is involved. So uh, that's the way this organization is working. Now coming to uh, intelligence agencies, there are a number of intelligence agencies which are functioning in this area. However, uh, while going through various occurrences of uh, national security in maritime domain, there was a sense which came that many of these organizations are working in isolation and there is reasonable amount of blame game or delay of sharing of information or hiding of information. And I think these are issues which can well be addressed by a synchronization. And that is what is required. Now, uh, non-conventional security threats also come uh, when we look at our uh, relations and the maritime borders with our neighbor. So starting with Pakistan, uh, the, this area always is very uh, high in terms of activities of uh, illegal nature. Now coming to the background of the problem which exists, uh, in 1908, the province of Sindh and Kutch had a dispute regarding claims over Sir Creek, which were put at bay. And after partition, uh, there was nothing much spoken about it. However, in 1965, Pakistan again raked up this issue. Uh, they said that this channel was a seasonal uh, uh, you know, channel and therefore the boundary alignment should be in favor uh, to the farthest extent. Whereas India wanted this thing to be divided into half as a division line. So both these countries went into international court and fought and the decision came in favor of India. However, uh, in last so many years, both the countries have had 12 rounds of talk and nothing decisive have, has come up. But then the uh, ground realities are, are that there are a lot of illegal fishing activities are happening in this area. There is a lot of movement of uh, you know uh, drugs and other items which uh, needs to be controlled and put under check. Now, uh, as far as Bangladesh is concerned, in, in 1980s, Bangladesh raised up the issue regarding the maritime boundary alignment. Uh, they wanted uh, the alignment to be 
uh, equitable and uh, on the lines of equitability, whereas India was looking at equidistance. Uh, by 2009, uh, after a number of talks, Bangladesh decided to go to the International Court and take a verdict, and which came in favor of Bangladesh in 2014. So as of now, the economic uh, uh, exclusive economic zone of Bangladesh is something like this. So uh, India did lose a reasonable amount of claim that it was making in this area. But uh, look at the positive side of it. This has put things in uh, the logical order. So today, uh, with all these disputes settled, there is huge uh, scope of economic activities private investments in this area and we should go by the tides and um, try to take the maximum benefit of uh, this issue getting resolved. As far as Sri Lanka is concerned, in 1976, we signed treaty with, uh, with Sri Lanka, putting the issues at Gulf, uh, the, uh, the Gulf of Manar and the Bay of Bengal at uh, you know, rest. We also signed a Tri-Nation Treaty in 1976, again, with the Maldives involved to ensure that there is no ambiguity as far as the maritime border is concerned. However, uh, the Pak state still has certain issues where there are claims from the Indian side as well as the Sri Lankan side, because of which uh, fishermen from both the countries are found crossing uh, their own waters and landing up in the international waters with uh, arrest and many other things, which is an irritant for both the countries. And this is an issue which requires a resolution. Now, uh, next is uh, the issue of uh, drug movement. If you see this area, India is surrounded by the Golden Triangle and the Golden Crescent. And because of this, uh, the movement of drugs uh, does involve involvement of people in India. And uh, this has added a lot of illegal activities. So uh, the security agencies uh, need to focus more on this, understand the patterns, and be more effective. As far as uh, piracy is concerned, in 2005, uh, the piracy issue was flagged at the international level because of the activities of the Somalian pirates. Uh, 2008 onwards, the Indian Navy got involved. There were reasonable deployment along with uh, many other navies of the world. And over the years, this area has been put to stability. There are very less activities of the Somalian pirates in this area. As far as uh, area closer to the Indian coast is concerned, there have been few incidences over the years. By and large, uh, the Indian coast areas have been secure. However, our uh, agencies, that is the Indian Coast Guard and the Indian Navy, are very cautious and these areas are under surveillance to ensure that uh, nothing happens. The next threat is of the offshore assets. Over the years, if you see the offshore uh, drilling and exploration has gone volumetrically very high. India's dependence on offshore uh, gas would increase by 28% by uh, 1932. Keeping that in mind, the work has to continue. A lot of uh, private agencies are involved, but then there are threats which would come with offshore assets whether it is uh, sabotage, vandalization, uh, uh, incident activity, or many other terror uh, threats. So we need to ensure that uh, the agencies which are responsible for running these offshore assets and their uh, security structure gets aligned with the national security structure, ensuring that there is no uh, gaps. Uh, very lately, uh, there has been news all over the TV channels stating that one of the uh, you know, there was an incident where people lost their life because uh, they were not evacuated on time because of uh, uh, the warning was not being taken seriously. So such issues also required to be addressed and that is how, uh, you know, this thing needs to work. Apart from these threats, uh, the working mechanism of the uh, offshore will uh, have certain uh, issues uh, in terms of chemical spill, oil spill, uh, liquid waste, uh, accidents. So uh, all these structures, which uh, I mean, which are existing today, to address them, they seem quite inadequate, and uh, they, they, there is a certain you know firefight to uh, respond to many of these occurrences. Whereas we need to have proper mechanism, more uh, synchronized setups to ensure that uh, if and when such incidents do take place, our response capability is at the optimum level. Now, uh, deep sea mining exploration is taking place. Uh, 
India has taken 10,000 square kilometer within Indian Ocean region to do deep sea mining, primarily to do look for cobalt uh, and uh, you know uh, many other polymetallic uh, uh, nodules. But uh, apart from India, there is. Uh, China, which is also doing deep sea exploration in this same area, there are many other agencies which would also be functioning in this area for exploration. My concern is, what if there is any, uh, you know, occurrence of episode uh, which uh, which leads to oil spill or leads to any disaster which will impact uh, the Indian coastline? Uh, what mechanisms are in place? Uh, well, uh, this is one issue which really needs to be brought into the center light and work needs to be done. That how do we safeguard ourselves from such issues? Uh, as far as the coastal economic zones are concerned, uh, initially the government decided to piecemeal develop these coastal economic zone, but later on the policy was revised and they were uh, you know, uh, simultaneously addressed for development. Uh, there is a lot of work which is taking place, but as far as the security is concerned, much of it has been left to the state governments to look after. Uh, now the issue is, unless these areas are safe, because much of industrialization would come here, much of the movement of goods would take place. So there is a reasonable requirement to look into the security paraphernalia, which we would extend to these uh, coastal economic zones in the coming years. Now, uh, coming to the major ports in India, the 12 ports of uh, India, which are major, they have reasonable amount of security mechanisms in place. But my concern is to 187 non-major ports which are run in private or by the state governments. Much of the security arrangements in these ports is quite ad hoc, <laughs> primarily because they are being guarded by private agencies. The security uh, protocols are not very standardized. So we need to look into this. We need to evaluate uh, much of the security audit done by intelligence agencies has reflected and put up in the parliamentary committee reports also that uh, it is uh, wanting. Much needs to be done. There are investments which are required to ensure that not only are ports safe, they are reliable in terms of uh, their business uh, that they undertake. Uh, in the last, uh, in the concluding chapter, I, I felt, uh, you know, uh, piecemeal at every junction, I intervened and gave my recommendations. But the last chapter was, what are the challenges uh, which uh, overall fit into uh, the issues of the coastal security? Firstly, is compartmentalization. Every department which is involved, whether it is under the state government or the central government agencies, they are not compartmentalized. Uh, probably it is time to break this compartmentalization by sharing more information, having better coordination, probably more deputation at all levels, from the top to the bottom, so that we have an understanding of each other's uh, challenges and we find a middle way to work together. There is also a requirement of having uh, the training institutes for security agencies. Much of the reliance is still on the Navy and the Indian Coast Guard, but the training institutions for the Marine Police and various other agencies is missing. The fund management, if you look, there is immense amount of funding which has been done, but much of it has got wasted. Like if you look at the boat procurement, individually states have procured boats with a reasonable amount of funds generation, but nothing has been kept for their maintenance. And what has led to it that many of these boats which were procured five, seven years back are in a state of disuse. So such wastage of funds need to be addressed and we need to make optimum use of our resources. Uh, then it is an issue of people's participation. In um, Jammu Kashmir, there is a concept of son of the soil, where the TA battalions recruit the locals. And the primary objective is to make them feel part of the security structure. Possibly uh, in the years to come, we need to see more people's participation as far as the maritime security is concerned. Uh, then it is a vast area of responsibility, no doubt technology has to be brought in place, but then we need to see a balance of what technology will give us and how much will it impact the smooth movement of our economic activities. And definitely the uh, security of the non-major port. I think that uh, issue itself uh, can be covered in a full book because there is much, much which needs to be done in that regard. Uh, with this, I come to the end of my uh, talk and uh, 
if there are any questions i would be very happy to take them on thank you sir uh, that was certainly a very comprehensive and detailed presentation and we we'll go into the q and a session now i request all of the participants to kindly post your questions in the chat box and they'll be taken up now so the first question comes from dr sibapada rath who has asked you three questions would you prefer if i asked you the questions together sir or one after the other uh, please go uh, in one go i'll note them down and accordingly i'll respond sure sir the first question is what is the role of trade unions in the performance of indian courts the second question is what uh, can, can you repeat this one uh, what is the what is the role of trade unions in the performance of indian courts okay the question is what is the extent of penetration of cyber technology in indian courts what is the extent of penetration of cyber technology in okay. indian courts and the third okay. question is what is the legal framework in place for the security of indian courts okay uh, to start with uh, the first question of uh, this is in the, these questions are by uh, dr rat i believe yes sir uh, so a uh, very good evening to you uh, we are well acquainted and probably done lot of discussions during my time in nmf also uh, well to start with sir uh, your question regarding the trade union well that's a major concern as of today uh, the last data available said uh, the trade union covers uh, nearly 44000 workers and there is a thought process of reducing the strength uh, they they have major issues in terms of health hazards there are major issues regarding the security movements uh, permanency for work there are a lot of people who are tem temporary in nature so uh, the trade unions have their own regular rules but every state uh, has uh, you know a different dynamics as far as the trade unions are concerned uh, if you say uh, are they facilitator or are they creating inertia uh, that's a call to take uh, because uh, ultimately the aim of creating those trade unions were to ensure that the best interest of people working in ports was ensured Uh, but over the time, uh, there is regional level politics, various other issues. Now, how much are they effective is a question, and this question is not only asked in India; it is uh, in various places, uh, various places. So, I during my study did want to enter into Indian port and ask these questions on ground. But uh, for me, probably NMF upgraded me and sent me to Israel. So I happened to speak to one of uh, the port authorities there. So he said, you know, we have given port operations. Uh, Uh, at certain areas in some uh, you know uh, some areas to the chinese primarily because of the trade unions being so strong and having such a high inertia that it was impacting our uh, you know uh, uh, the operations of the port so i think uh, the situation is no different in indian ports uh, today much of the trade unions uh, are not playing as positive role which is expected so when i covered a part of my chapter and uh, which is environmental concern so lot of concern whether it was sound pollution whether so many other issues which affect people who are working in port and they came into light and i realized you know the trade unions are not performing optimally so that is one to answer as far as the cyber technology in port is concerned uh, in the start of the discussion uh, the moderator had uh, moderator had spoken about uh, the uh, 4.0 technology and uh, uh, obviously without cyber uh, security cover nothing is going to work so that's that's uh, that's a major concern uh, the which uh, if you say whether they have been penetrated in open media in no text uh, there is any incident which says that the security has been compromised per se 
but uh, definitely it is a vibrant thread and uh, nations are putting things in order making uh, the checks and balances more complex so that you know they don't become vulnerable to the cyber, uh, the cyber technology threats as far as the legal aspect is concerned uh, you must have uh, lately heard the news that the indian port association has undergone a lot of uh, changes the participation of people with boots on ground has increased in the management and uh, the procedures are being put uh, in a standardized format so a lot of work has been done but uh, i probably would uh, evade the question of saying what technical aspects have been brought into light because to my uh, knowledge as of now i have not read into the specifics which have come in paper but yes there is a thought process of uh, improving overalling the, the working of these association port, uh, port uh, authority uh, I, I hope i have answered much of his uh, queries thank you sir the next question is from mr ashish baya who is a research intern he says okay. the mou signed between the indian coast guard and bangladesh coast guard in 2015 does not contain anything about restricting illegal and irregular immigration between the countries considering the recent high influx of irregular immigration from bangladesh into india should the mou be revisited and amended in order to insert a clause regarding illegal immigration okay uh, mr ashish you said has this question well uh, uh, again when you look at uh, the riverine borders um, covering areas of sundarban uh, especially between india and bangladesh during uh, the rainy seasons it is extremely difficult uh, for covering these areas rather much of the security agencies uh, stay defunct uh, the patrollings are low during these times and uh, you know these areas are generally with lot of open gaps for violation and many reports and many uh, print information says that while the security agencies get restricted to function during the monsoon time but many of the illegal activities take place during those times so when you see this entire area you realize that it is extremely difficult no matter what uh, mou uh, we may you know sign with bangladesh as far as uh, blocking illegal immigration is concerned but there are multiple mechanical uh, routes which are accessible between both these porous borders so probably i uh, would say as things stand today in terms of our technological upgradation financial spending in these areas uh, are we in a position to put it 100% at uh, stake probably not and even if india steps up to that level would bangladesh be able to do that that's a question because any illegal activity it is not only in illegal immigration there are a lot of uh, you know movement of illegal uh, material stuff which is also taking place so point is uh, definitely it should happen but uh, and we must continuously engage with bangladesh but uh, 2015 agreement did it suffice or any agreement in the coming days would suffice i really don't see but yes it should be in our uh, talking point uh, kind of a thing which should over the years get resolved with better better mechanism better funding better resources at hand yeah thank you sir our next question is from our director commodore ravasan sir he asked yeah. with increased emphasis on inland waterways of some 14500 kilometers what security architecture is envisaged uh, uh, now that's a very uh, valid question because when i started reading about inland waterways there are 110 of them uh, being spoken about and a uh, few of them you are aware haldia connecting uh, towards uh, the hinterland Uh, they started functioning also but then the point is uh, when we say what is the security uh, security uh, should not just be taken as a violent act in terms of you know somebody sabotaging the entire thing and security will cover wider spectrum of requirements whether the uh, product reaches safely 
whether there, there is no uh, damage which takes place, uh, you know, in terms of movement of the uh, vessels, uh, there is no uh, impact on the environment. So there are many, many issues which need to be uh, seen into. There is one organization I often would not remember, but definitely it is in uh, Bihar, Patna, which is looking after inland water security setups. But I tried going into its website, trying reading something, but I didn't really find any formal, uh, you know, structure. Uh, development and that is why a thought came to my mind that if we intend to do anything of this type uh, we really need to because you see when these structures will come in place uh, there will be tax collection all states uh, would definitely ask uh, a nominal price for the maintenance of the river line movement and their maintenance. And when that happens, uh, there, uh, if you start generating income through the usage of such resources, there has to be people on ground to ensure that uh, uh, these uh, you know facilities are available. So as of now, I see uh, much needs to be given as a thought to these areas, and uh, we need to work uh, on security. So that, that, that's a great area, I would say. I would not have a direct answer of what are we doing as of now? Yeah. So the next question is from Asma Masood. She asks, yeah. kindly share about the extent of security in the communication channels between Indian ports and ships, including satellite communication. Yeah, so um, you see, uh, that's a very valid one and again it brings to the same question of uh, industry 4.1 the better communication the ships can uh, have with the port the lesser is the waiting in time the better is the utilization of the facilities that they are looking for when they land up dock at the port in case if the traffic is heavier they can be given some alternative mechanisms to be parked so we uh, whoever uh, is reading in these lines would know about all these issues uh, that you know uh, there are uh, uh, ample of uh, resources or facilities that the incoming ship look uh, especially in terms of non wastage of their time uh, access to various facilities and uh, getting their loads and moving as fast as possible from this port and landing up in the next so uh, for that uh, technological linking is very important obviously the satellites play a major role uh, and uh, uh, that way some ports abroad are doing it I, I read about how Singapore port does it because that is uh, having uh, the highest uh, volumetric movement I mean I would not say the highest now there are Chinese ports which are more uh, cargo ships moving in but uh, Singapore is also a busy port so when I started reading much before the, uh, the you know ships are in the channels they already know where it to be part uh, what are consignments are to be collected what all facilities are required but uh, our all our ports having this, uh, I doubt, and uh, the material which is available does not support it, especially for non-major ports, which are now increasing in terms of their traffic. If you see the figures of uh, last five, seven years, the traffic which is now going to non-major ports is increasing. Now, the issue is when the uh, traffic increases, are they capable of providing these facilities? Uh, to my best of knowledge, no. There is much which further needs to be done in this regard. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, the next two questions are from Mr. Syed Sadiq Hussain. I'll ask you both the questions together, sir. Uh, the first yeah. question is, Sri Lanka leased the Humban Tota port to China for 99 years by the debt trap. How will India tackle the domination against Chinese aggression since they want their influence over the Indian Ocean? The second question is, is the Chabahar port in Iran the answer to China's Belt and Road Initiative for the connection for connection to Europe? And does India have any other upcoming plans for economic corridors? Oh, well, um, these both questions are quite broad in terms that one can speak um, quite a bit on this, but I have an uh, eye on the watch uh, and keeping that in place, I will cryptically say a few things. As far as Hamban Tota port is concerned, uh, uh, it's, it, it's been on over the news. 
that uh, the, you know the management of the port has now gone to Chinese. Uh, same is happening in many other countries. Now the thing is, uh, you carry a reputation. There is a uh, you know uh, fear in major nations whether they are developed or underdeveloped regarding the reliability of such Chinese investment. So many nations are pulled out of such investment. If you see happenings in Malaysia, Indonesia, they are pulling out of the Chinese investments. So uh, and the uh, you know if this continues, uh, will they be able to replicate uh, Hamantota port kind of a uh, model? I don't think so. So when we compare our model with the Chinese, we as a nation are very slow. We are a big giant uh, elephant which moves slowly. But we are generally a fair player. So uh, we carry that reputation that it, India may be slow to deliver. But at least our interests are not wasted. We, we, we are not going to be doing anything which is harmful for those nations who we interact with. So I think in the long run, that repute that we carry is more important. As far as Chabar Port is concerned, Yes, our intent was uh, definitely to ensure that our supply lines from Middle East are not affected. And we have countered to the Gadar port which Chinese are building. But uh, because of issues in Iran, uh, this entire thing went uh, multiple times with uh, you know, a reasonable amount of problems. So, uh, and the positioning, posturing has changed. Uh, it is very logical for two nations to come together and become friends for such align uh, you know, alliances. But when they there are rifts in terms of doubt when Iran is under embargo and India supports a portion of that uh, activities. Then definitely it has impact, uh, cascading impact on uh, you know the ports also. So uh, whether this Chabar port has come the way it was supposed, it was planned, probably not. But is it a waste? Definitely not, because um, in the times to come, uh, as India progresses, we become one major player who you you can go around. You may try to avoid it, but uh, but then we will be in your thoughts. Uh, we are going to be important. So uh, we have to have such engagements and a fair engagements. Their quantum probably are not very uh, you know high in scale, but as I see uh, over the years, uh, definitely we will have uh, a major major uh, say in uh, such activities like development of ports. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The next question is from the program executive at NMF, and he says, "Sir, environmental disasters also impact the hard security aspect. What would be an approach to create more resilient ports in India?" Uh, well, that's a very valid one uh, because uh, you know any 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 uh, any structure of development which takes place. Uh, if you want it to last for a very long time, definitely you need to spend more amount of money to ensure that they have longevity, uh, they have the capacity to withstand natural calamities and various other issues. Now the issue is that uh, that is in the wish list. Everybody would like to do that, but it involves cost, and many of the private agencies would not like to you know spend too much. But here is where the government regulatory mechanisms come into place. So when you look at government guidelines, they are well in place. So any port level development, whether it is being done by private agencies or by coordination with private agencies, it is put under reasonable amount of scanner. So uh, when you see, I was uh, reading about the uh, Adani port which has come. So uh, there was reasonable amount of delay which took place. So the delay was because of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, queries that the government had, the kind of security norms they had to follow. So there are checks and balances which are definitely exist. And they are there to ensure that such crises of environmental damage don't take place. So to say it's a free ride for private uh, setups and other things, it is not. There are enough mechanisms in place, but are they at the highest optimum level? Probably not because every mechanism of ensuring security is cost oriented. So how much is the cost that you are ready to pay is an issue. Like uh, Japan generally spends a lot of money. They have an airport almost created in the ocean. So uh, it is fully functional, taking flights day in, day out. Uh, but there is a huge cost uh, they have paid to ensure that uh, that uh, particular uh, you know airport is functional. Now the point is how much is the cost uh, we are ready to pay is a question. So it's a balance. How much is the cost and how much is uh, the safety that you're looking for? Yeah. Thank you, sir. The next question is again from our director, Vasan, sir. Uh, he says, the Coast Guard did a good job of nabbing MV Seaman Guard Ohio 
which was found in our waters with undeclared weapons and were involved as floating armory. How do you look at it since the case was acquitted? What went wrong in the application of the law? Uh, to be very honest, I would uh, I would be very honest to say that I have not read this case in the legality. It's a hearsay news uh, I would have uh, heard. But uh, to say that, uh, you know, uh, whether I've gone into the technicality of this specific case, I'm not privy. But to a general understanding, uh, the Coast Guard has a mandate. When any particular uh, ship is in the international waters, then probably the Coast Guard does not get that mandate to intervene. And if you involve agencies like the Indian Navy, then it has got international ramifications. So sometimes uh, there may be technical aspects in, in terms of the jurisdiction which has been exercised. Uh, if it does not have that legal mandate, obviously uh, you, you cannot exercise that. So probably something of this type would have occurred, but uh, for me to comment beyond this on this specific case would not be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next question is from Mr. Yudhisthar Singh Ranawar. He says, how vital is Lakshwadeep strategically for India and the international community as one of the richest sea routes passes through the Lakshwadeep? How can growing Chinese influence on the Indian coast in recent times and the smuggling of narcotics from the Makran coast to the international shipping lanes along the Lakshwadeep coast be tackled? Uh. Well, uh, I, before leaving NMF, had written one uh, article that was regarding island and uh, the importance of islands. So, uh, when we look at uh, 1,095 islands that India has, and many of them in the <coughs> area of Lakshadweep and Andaman and Nicobar, they're strategically very important for India. Uh, does any other country lay claim? There are some islands where there are common claims of our neighbors. Uh, probably our focus today is not there. But definitely these islands are like watch posts uh, which are there. In fact, uh, I remember asking DG in one of our telephone con conversation that what if in one of these areas you have, uh, you know, those laser uh, operated uh, uh, weapons which can completely swap through the ranges and dominate this entire area. Uh, so it will be extremely difficult for anybody to counter such, uh, you know, uh, deployments or uh, utilization of force in such areas as far as security is concerned. In terms of trade also, these uh, regions will be important. If you go back into the history, uh, the Britishers had used Lakshwadi for repairing of ships. And some of the islands had the facility for repairing. So the point is, whether you look at it from the trade perspective or the security perspective, uh, they are important. And the kind of focus that we need to have on these islands is not there. Many of them have got inundated. They, they have become non-livable. Many of the islands have been uh, vacated and uh, post-tsunami. Uh, but uh, not much has been done to ensure that how do we recoup out of it. Uh, an inundated island cannot not be just left. You cannot just walk away from it stating that, you know, uh, it is left to its own fate. Definitely, this is an issue. And uh, uh, there is much which needs to be written about it, much needs to be talked about it, much needs to be done in terms of policy adjustments. Yeah. Thank you, sir. The last question is from Miss Ishita S. She says, how does the observer status being given to India in the Indian Ocean Commission provide an authoritative stance or leadership role in maritime security to India? Uh, if, uh, if this is a little tricky, can you just repeat this one again? Uh, can you just repeat this one again? Yeah. yeah. She asks, how does the observer status being given to India in the Indian Ocean Commission provide an authoritative stance or leadership role in maritime security to India? Uh, to be very honest, I would acknowledge this fact that this deep specific question has not been dwelled by me in detail. But uh, to say anything which is with an observer status for India, I mean, uh, we are a nation which is the largest democracy. We are the nation which is to rise amongst the ladder of first, second nation in the world. We are still struggling to put a point through to have permanent seat in the United Nations, with every strong member agreeing that our role should be there. So when we talk of Indian Ocean, 
definitely uh, india being there is obviously a positive thing and rather uh, taking it as an achievement or some favor i mean it is something which should have been there because ultimately uh, we become a uh, rightful uh, you know uh, nation to uh, have our view points expressed in this area Uh, the issues that i raised in terms of uh, deep sea mining the issue of offshore uh, exploration which is taking place the environmental damage the number of ships much moving through these areas i'm sure the indian ocean commission is looking into all these aspects and having india as an observer definitely gives us voice to raise the concern that is it has on these issues so i'm sure this is a positive move but i would not comment beyond it because i don't know what is the mandate on specific issues which india has raised on this uh, particular commission yeah yes sir there's one last question from commodore vasan sir commodore yeah. vasan commodore vasan has asked the illegal yeah. unreported and unregulated fishing poses okay. a great security challenge not yes. only in terms of livelihood but also in terms of infringement of security in sensitive areas what is your mm -hmm. take on having the maritime neighbors coming together on a format like dosti 2.0 so a regional maritime architecture in the arabian sea and bay of bengal would serve the cause of the sustainable fisheries what is your take on this he has asked yeah uh, well uh, as far as the illegal fishing activities are concerned uh, i i was uh, having one interaction in hyderabad with uh, where you know there is a center for all satellite uh, interpretation so they said we we have reached a level where uh, on a very regular day to day basis they tell the fishermen which are the areas they need to access and where the uh, breeding is now complete and they could fish these areas which have now become weak in terms of uh, availability of fishes so that is the level of satellite uh, usage now we are doing as far as the fishing and catches are concerned now the second part which uh, uh, commander vasan said was regarding illegal fishing obviously uh, uh, i remember um, admiral chohan once mentioning because i have not been out on sea so i heard it from his view he said it is like going into a big busy market street there are n number of ships and n number of vessels which are floating and to identify who is who becomes a very very difficult proposition so in such a scenario where there are multiple vessels with a variety of sizes is there will be porousness where illegal fishing would take place and definitely uh, agencies of uh, various countries uh, especially the neighbors if they get together they can find a better mechanism but uh, how important uh, these are uh, because uh, i if sir is listening he did mention you know to that extent that the naval fleets moving into the uh, oceans sometimes have to take a detour not to destroy their nets you know that is the strength of um, the kind of uh, hold they have because of political cloud or whatever one can say so uh, you know the, the, when the issue of livelihood comes then sometimes uh, you will have to look the other side and uh, say okay we know some amount of illegal things are on but uh, uh, they are acceptable to an extent uh, further refinement definitely we need to have mechanisms to separate there should not be illegal fishing from our side or their side there are mechanism of registration of the boat there are enough uh, you know transformers which are put uh, transformers which uh, give you the location of the ships so there are security agencies which are looking at to monitoring uh, ships which go from our side but then there are practical problems a fisher when would land up in the sea closes transformer uh, transponder he would be fishing at the night hours so they try to regulate out of a system which the security agencies try to put in place so yes there is definitely a need to you know make these systems more refined within our own state and also uh, to coordinate with our neighbors and ensure that illegal fishing whether in our waters or in their waters Uh, should be avoided yeah thank you sir for quickly answering all of the questions that were raised i'd like to hand over the session to our moderator commodore vijay thank you nisha thank you so much uh, well done uh, dr mohit nayar that's a very nice presentation very comprehensive presentation about your book And I would uh, like to uh, give compliments to DG NMF Admiral Chauhan for uh, baptizing a army officer into a maritime world officer. 
Yeah, I, I strongly endorse that, sir. Yeah. So I think there's a great uh, job done by NMF. I think you have covered the your book and your presentation has covered the maritime aspect of coastal threat, threat to shipping, environment, and how complex it is. I'm sure in our own country till 2008, when we had this uh, horrible 2611, nobody knew how many agencies have been brought in. But okay. the DG X, DG Coast Guard, Maradam Burli is here. And we have been doing so many exercises almost every year. But the fact remains, and you brought it out very nicely, the compartmentalization. Everybody is still independent. Finally, it is the Navy, it is the Coast Guard, it is the Marine Police to some extent. And the fishermen, they are coming big way now. That is a positive point. They are becoming a big force now because they realize they are the foot soldiers that like the Army has. They are the foot soldiers. And they know which boat actually has come in their area without at times will we then report to us now. There's a good thing that happened after that. This so many agency you discuss one by one. Yes, they all are there. Everybody has their responsibility laid down very detailed. To the last point. But commitment, involvement, looking to the security, a bigger aspect. It remains a question, but I'm sure we all are very optimistic as a great nation. And as we are looking to the blue economy in a big way, they all come on board. And of course, there is no far. So I'm sure it will happen one day very soon. I've been, uh, I was in Delhi when uh, or IMAC was being set up. That is around 2012. And today, IMAC is a full established uh, establishment in sitting in Delhi or Bombay. You can track who is where up to fishing boat level. So there's a great achievement and coastal security is being looked after very, very effectively. Yes, there's always room for improvement. And you just said uh, one question had come. That we have a communication. Communication is still not secure today. When a merchant ship, a merchant navy ship is coming to the port, his communication is open channels. So probably there's a way to go ahead because I said IT 4.0, in industry 4.0. It is the major threat today. Piracy is being handled, is being tracked. Armed mercenary, Komodo Vasan asked the question, and very happy that you, you mentioned after learning so much of maritime, you're going through the law. So there's a next uh, topic for you to learn and come back to us. Why trade? Because it's so complex. Unlike the uh, land borders, the maritime borders, the maritime lines are not so well defined. They are there, but not well defined. Similar thing happened to Kochi. The question is dragging the courts. So maritime scenario, maritime conflict, maritime threat are very, very hazy most of the times. Climate mentioned, and you answered very well, that this is the biggest threat now, and Colombo port is facing it right now. We had recently, uh, sometime back in Onu, when the oil spills took place. Now, this threat brings further uh, next threat to us. Now, this Colombo, what happened, it happened away from the port. Imagine it was a non conventional threat planned by a conventional somebody close to the port, and then you have fire near the port because there's a explosive material which was not supposed to be there. What happens then? So, these are the threats which have to look into in more detail now. Now, as for technology is concerned, this is, a, this is the one area which I will be looking at because the networking, the interaction of all services, sharing information, and so-called net-centric warfare, which we maybe we talk about. We have satellite, we have communication, we have radars. Like if all come in one pool, then everybody knows who is where. Of course, gray zone will remain there, but much, much less hazy. As far as land security is concerned, the port security is concerned, which is CISF right now, probably it has to go much more way, in my view. I do deal with port securities here. The dentists are not very convinced it is very, very secure. They are still at very primitive stages. But I'm sure as we are looking, developing the blue economic standard, and you cover most of the areas, we are looking, the Andaman now, we're looking, you said Hamman Tota, I say Hamman Tota, yes, is there, is a concern today. But we will work out an alternate for Why not? The Campbell Bay is looking up for transshipment. Why not? China is also big, big. China, we can counter any day we want. We have to go with that um, in our mind. So, a book well covered.
very well cover most of the issues very well handle the questions and uh, i think all mer maritime uh, going uh, students people who are interested in maritime or the coast must read this book it's a nice book it appears to have the presentation and thank you so much it's uh, my pleasure sir thank you so much thank you so much uh, vijay sir uh, thank you very much for moderating so well may i request uh, director general to uh, flag a few issues for the next army officer who is going to join nmf <laughs> that that is already being done but let me uh, quickly while i've got an opportunity once again compliment you mohit uh, on this very uh, good presentation of your book and i thought that the presentation questions were in many cases uh, unfair because uh, they covered the span far greater yes. than ports and uh, port security but uh, i must once again compliment you on the skill with which you answered them and also your honesty with which you declined to answer those that you didn't have adequate uh, first hand knowledge on which is team and guard ohio and the ioc and i just wanted to uh, make one point that is that you know when we talk about uh, security maritime security we must be quite clear about what we are talking about how much of because security covers a very large ambit and uh, we tend to talk about military or uh, hard security issues alone and so i'm glad that the iuu fishing question came up and the once again the ioc uh, the indian ocean commission question and there isn't enough time for us to address all these issues now but perhaps uh, commodore vasan and i could uh, sit together and figure out whether there would couldn't be another uh, nmf um, intensive uh, open sort of questions uh, webinar in which we just address all aspects of um, of maritime security in which of course we would be honored to have you uh, concentrate once again on the areas that your book covers thank you so much and thank you uh, vasan sir uh, thank you admiral chauhan and i uh, you know we also have the benefit of uh, former director general coast guard uh, would, you, would you like to uh, you know flag a few issues and uh, uh, offer some clarifications on some of the questions which uh, Mohit did not want to take up for uh, various reasons. Uh, thank you, sir. I think uh, Mohit has covered all issues very well, but there are just one or two issues that I would like to, you know, bring in since that is part of his presentation came in. One is after the as uh, Garg also mentioned after the twenty six eleven, we have put in place a very comprehensive plan to look after the overall security aspect. This. a uh, navy being the chief of the naval staff being the overall responsible for maritime security and the uh, dg coast guard who is under the naval uh, uh, umbrella to look after the coastal security aspects and we have actually defined what is to be done by the navy what is coast guard what is coastal patrol all other agencies and we set up a chain of you know lighthouse and radar station all around the coast uh, phase was i think phase 2 is also now nearly complete the imac has come up there so all that are in place so but like you said there are always lacuna and there are always territorial wars between the two you know now there is centralized ops room between the two services you can get it going and the very fact that the uh, you know enrica alexia grand i'm not talking about the uh, subsequent breakout but when such an incident happened you were able to get hold of the ship and bring it to an indian port for subsequent prosecution and other activities talks of the kind of uh, you know synergy that is built up and the security aspects that have come in and our surveillance and monitoring of course this is an ongoing process because of between our coastline and island territory is very large area that is one part which we can always do and the second part is you mentioned about coast guard going out you know navy can be relieved of some duties and coast guard going out for the interacting into the open area yes coast guard is already interacting and having regular exercises with you know as far as with the japanese coast guard you have with the singapore you have a regular exercise with the uh, maldives sri lankan navy bangladesh and you have a regular interaction with the pakistan uh, coast guard so all this is there in place we got to expand how further we can use this to further our requirements so that navy as in when the uh, you know indo pacific concept and other develops further naval ships will be more and more you know 
going out into the deeper oceans for their deployment so coast guard will have step in of course as of now coast guard also is the they have a master plan but the force levels have to come up to that level and it has to be a complete synergy between navy and coast guard so i think other than i have nothing further to add i think he has covered most of these issues thank you uh, thank you admiral burley uh, and also luckily we do have captain bangara i'll request him to kindly give us uh, about 3 uh, minutes on his views Uh, having been on the merchant navy and now looking after many companies in uh, colombo and here uh, what do you captain bangara oh thank you very much uh, commodore i didn't expect that um actually I, every uh, session with you all has enlightened me on the security aspects of it uh, so i will refrain from talking about it uh, but uh, the one thing that has been very glaring in the new uh, uh, accident that happened the fire on board the Uh, express uh, well clearly indicates that sri lanka is not geared to handle situations like this and they have been over dependent on india and we need to be uh, extra cautious to ensure that uh, our coast coastal areas do not get uh, polluted by any of these incidents we now know the express pearl is sitting uh, stern is uh, touching the bottom the hull is intact but god forbid if there is a fuel leak from there there is every opportunity for the fuel to find its way uh, of course to the uh, sri lankan coast but also to the indian coast um as regards the major ports and the and the non major ports which is presented uh, <clears throat> i must say the non major ports have done remarkably better job than the major ports in india they've caught up very well they put all the systems in place that performed better than the major ports um a good uh, example is mundra to start with and uh, we were very late in india to get into containerization and i think it's time we relook at this whole aspect considering that only 2% of the uh, indian trade is carried by indian ships as such so that speaks volumes about how we have handled what what sort of priority we've granted to our own shipping industry in india 98% is handled by foreign carriers which is all right but as long as we understand this and give the priority and uh, the allowance to the foreign carriers to operate over here um security wise i think you all have done a remarkable job both coast guard and the navy i don't have to speak about it but uh, my experience as a uh, i know i sailed for 28 years on, sh- on the ships and i've been ashore for another 24 years ashore all i can say is i think we need to um, give a lot more prominence to uh, seafarers i'm uh, referring to the merchant marine seafarers who have been ignored for too many years so we need to have a little more focus and also have people um, involved uh, in policy making people who are professionals have the capacity to uh, to to um you know give the right recommendations and commodore wasan i must thank you for this uh, very candid remarks you made on the television the other day regarding the ongc uh, barges because that's what we need to hear uh, uh, because uh, pu- pushing the problems under the carpet is not going to help us at all so thank you so much for that and thanks once again uh, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to air my views thank you very much and if i may add Uh, Dr. Mohit Nayal, you did an excellent job of uh, presentation. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Captain Bangara. These are vital inputs, and I am sure we'll involve you more in the joint thank discussions you, to get a perspective from the the seafarer, you know, which, which is uh, ignored most of the time, though they sustain the entire economy of the nation. So, we will uh, try and engage you uh, in another session uh, where you can have some perspectives from your side. Uh, on and you know, what more can be done for seafarers uh, and and merchant ships ports etc uh, with that uh, back to you nisha thank you thank you commodore wasan um with that i'd like to hand over the session to my colleague ms padmashri anandan for the formal vote of thanks thank you nisha a good evening to all on behalf of team c3s i would like to take this opportunity to present this vote of thanks We sincerely thank Dr. Mohit Nayal for his valuable time, giving us an all-inclusive presentation on security aspect of India's ports and maritime trade. 
starting from the non-traditional security challenges, facets of technology in coastal security, to highlighting the security initiatives in the Indian Ocean region and responding to all our questions patiently. Thank you very much, sir. I also take this opportunity to thank the director of CPS, Commodore Aris Carlson, Indian Navy retired, for his enduring support. Our sincere thanks goes to Commodore Vijesh Garg, VSN Indian Navy, retired, for moderating the session. Thank you very much, sir. We express our gratitude to all the officers, veterans, research scholars, and interns present here for their active participation. I extend my thanks to my colleagues, Ms. Nisha and Mr. Balasubramanian, for their support. Thank you all once again. Jai Hind.